Perfect. Thank you. So um, welcome, everyone. Um, I hope you find the event today really interesting. Um, first of all, big thanks to Donald, Massimo and Phil for all of their work making this event happen. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in and for all of the generous donations that you've given when registering that will really help us to do some good things. And of course, thanks to the Aurelius Foundation who are hosting us today. We're borrowing their Zoom account for this event so we didn't have to buy one just for one day. And I say all of that with my um, Chair of Modern Stoicism hat on. I'm also involved in the Aurelius Foundation. And so with that hat on, um, I'd like to say how happy we are to be sponsoring and supporting this event today. Um, if you've not heard of the Aurelius Foundation before, please do check out our website. We've been holding a whole series of online events over the past few months and recordings of all of those are readily available um, along with recordings from our launch event that took place in March in London, just about a week or so before the UK lockdown kicked in. There's a good 10 hours or so of stoic video content uh, there for you to enjoy. Okay, so let me get down to business. What I want to do in this talk is to set out some key ideas in Stoicism in order to warm us up and to put us all on the same page. Whenever we've done public events like this in the past, we've often had a wide mix of people who've come along, some people who've been following Stoicism for a while and have become quite expert, um, and others who've only just heard about Stoicism and want to learn more. So this talk is mainly for the latter group, um, but hopefully there's going to be something for everyone. So my main aim then is to say something about the key ideas uh, in Stoicism, the key ideas that stand behind all of those inspirational quotes from Seneca and Marcus Aurelius that circulate on the internet. What are the foundational principles of Stoicism as a philosophy? I want to start by saying something about how the ancient Stoics understood their philosophy. Um, and according to the ancient Stoics, Stoicism is a philosophy with three parts, logic, physics, and ethics. And most of the Stoics insisted that these three parts form an integrated whole. And they used a variety of nice imagery to illustrate this. So they tell us that Stoic philosophy is like an egg. Logic is the shell, ethics is the white, and physics is the yoke. Or another attempt to explain the same relationship, philosophy is like an orchard. Logic is the enclosing wall, physics is the trees, and ethics is the fruit. Or again, like a human being, logic is the bones, ethics is the flesh, and physics is the soul. So different analogies put forward by different Stoics trying to explain this relationship. And in each case, the point that they want to make is that these three parts of philosophy form an integrated whole. You can't have an egg or an orchard or a human being without all three parts. You need all of them. So what I'm going to do is to say a bit about each of these three parts. I'm going to pick one key concept from each of those three parts and try to say something along the way about how these key concepts and parts fit together into a coherent whole. So let's start with logic. Now by logic, the Stoics mean something much broader than the way we tend to use that word today. I think the best way to characterize it is to say that it's concerned with knowledge. Um, so logic for the Stoics is concerned with what we can know, with what we say, the truthfulness of what we say, and the logical consistency of the arguments that we make. So it includes what we would now think of as logic, but it's also much wider than that. So 
The Stoics, like many ancient philosophers, think rationality is one of the defining characteristics of human beings. So they place great emphasis on the importance of logical consistency. And in fact, I think most of us do. Most of us do, even if we might not always be aware that we're doing so. Um, it's not uncommon, for instance, to hear people criticize others for being inconsistent, as if inconsistency is simply an inherently bad thing. None of us like hypocrites, for instance, or people who say one thing one moment only to contradict themselves moments later. Those aren't things that we particularly appreciate. And this idea of consistency will crop up a number of times in the rest of what I want to say. So hold on to that in the back of your minds. Now, there's so much we could say about Stoic logic, but I want to focus on just one key idea that comes from this part of Stoic philosophy. And it's the idea of judgments. So according to the Stoics, our judgments are the foundation for all of our knowledge. We receive information by the senses, it's presented to our minds, and then we make judgments about that information. Either we accept it or we reject it. And in the process, we create beliefs. Sometimes we make good judgments and sometimes we get things wrong. Now, obviously, this is important for thinking about what we can know and how we understand the world. But something that the Stoics also stress is that we don't just make judgments about matters of fact. We also make judgments about value. We make value judgments. And those value judgments that we make shape our lives. So we pursue the things that we judge are good and we try to avoid what we think is bad. We feel happy when we get the things that we think are good and frustrated when we can't. So our emotional lives, the Stoics argue, are effectively the product of the judgments that we make. So thinking about judgments is absolutely central to Stoic philosophy. Let's have a look at a couple of short quotes. So very famously, Epictetus says, it's not things that upset us, but our judgments about things. And Marcus Aurelius touches on this idea as well, when he wrote, don't say more to yourself than first impressions report. You've been told that someone speaks ill of you. That's what you've been told. You have not been told that you've been harmed. So the first task then, according to the Stoics, is to pay attention to our judgments. All too often, we make judgments quickly, unthinkingly, almost unconsciously. And instead, the Stoics think that we ought to, in effect, slow down, try to open up some kind of cognitive distance between the moment that we experience something and making a judgment about it. And this could apply in a variety of different situations. So it could apply to hastily accepting some dubious news story that you've seen on social media or reacting angrily to a perceived insult. In both cases, pausing before rushing to make a judgment will enable us to respond in a more measured and appropriate way. So this is why judgment is a key concept for the Stoics. And as I've said, it's a key concept within the area of logic within Stoic philosophy. Okay, this leads us on, I think, into the next part of Stoic philosophy, ethics, the white of the egg. If logic is ultimately about knowledge, then ethics is primarily about value. It's concerned with what's good, what's bad, what we ought to do and not do. And many people curious about Stoicism today may think they're only interested in the ethics, 
that's the practical bit. But as I've already tried to show, the logic is essential too, especially the role played by our judgments. In the second passage that we looked at a moment ago, which I'll just flick back to, Marcus Aurelius effectively says that if someone speaks ill of you, nothing bad has happened. If you judge that something bad did happen, you've made a mistake. So why does Marcus think that being spoken about in unpleasant terms isn't a bad thing? And that opens up for us the question of value. What does and does not have value? And it's going to introduce the key concept in ethics that I want to focus on, namely virtue. So what's good and what's bad? The Stoics argue that anything that's good, anything that's genuinely inherently good, will always benefit us. It will consistently benefit us. So there's the idea of consistency again that I mentioned earlier when talking about logic. The only thing that the Stoics think falls into this category of consistently benefiting us is having an excellent character or state of mind. Now, it can be quite difficult to pin down what they mean by this, because there are so many different aspects to it. So it means being rational, being consistent, being mentally healthy, one might say, not overcome by disruptive emotions, and possessing a range of positive character traits, such as being moderate, courageous, and fair or just. If you've got all these things, you will flourish in any and every situation, the Stoics argue, no matter what life throws at you. Moreover, there's no situation where having a calm and rational frame of mind will make things worse. Equally, there's no obvious situation where being anxious, irritable, or aggressive is going to benefit you, they'd say. Having a good character is always a good thing and never a bad thing. And that's why they claim it's the only genuinely good thing there is. So if we want to live a good life, the most important thing we need to do is to attend to ourselves, to how we think about things. So we're back to judgments again. And what we think has most value. If you think that maintaining a calm frame of mind is what matters most, then like Marcus, you'll try to avoid judging that you've been harmed if someone speaks ill of you. Because if you do judge that you've been harmed, it will in fact be you who is harming yourself. For as we saw Epictetus say, it's not things that disturb us, but our judgments about things. Okay, what about everything else? What about all the other things that many of us play so much value on and spend much of our lives pursuing? Money, possessions, success, reputation. Are any of these things good? The Stoics are going to say no, because although sometimes they might benefit us, they don't consistently benefit us. They don't always benefit us. And in particular, having those sorts of things won't guarantee that we can live a good, happy life. And we know this from all the endless stories about the misery of the rich and famous that we read in celebrity media reports. Now, of course, sometimes these things can be great and not everyone who has them is miserable. But the Stoics would say that when that's the case, the reason why those people aren't miserable is because the person in question has the right frame of mind. They have a good character. That's the thing that's generating the happiness. If you're psychologically in a mess, 
no amount of fame and fortune is going to fix that. So if you want to be happy, rather than pursue these external things, what you need to do, the Stoics will say, is attend to yourself, to your judgments, to how you think about things. Let me paraphrase something from Seneca that nicely illustrates this thought. When someone complained to Socrates that traveling had done him no good, Socrates replied, what do you expect? You took yourself with you. We can never escape ourselves, as Socrates noted, so it's unsurprising that this is the one thing that will ultimately determine the quality of our lives. And we need to attend to that before we start worrying about anything else. Okay. Let's now move on to the third part of Stoic philosophy, the physics. For the Stoics, physics is simply the study of nature, the study of what exists. And this, they think, is the third essential part of philosophy. Now, there's a lot that we could say about this, and some of it raises some big issues. For instance, the Stoics say that nature is governed or organized by a rational principle, which they identify with God. Now, this isn't the God like the one that we know from the monotheistic religions. It's simply this rational principle. And the way we get to understand it is by studying nature. They also say that this organizing principle within nature arranges things providentially. But again, it's complicated because they identify providence with what we might also call mechanistic fate, which in turn is identified with just simple physical cause and effect. So in short, there are multiple ways in which we might try to understand what's going on in Stoic physics. Not all of the ancient Stoics agreed with one another about the details. And some people drawn to Stoicism today have suggested that given that much of their ancient physics is inevitably outdated, we shouldn't get too concerned about any of the details. And I think we'll hear a number of other people later on um, today talk about this um, in their talks and ways in which we might update parts of Stoicism. Um, and it's the physics potentially is the bit that we might want to update. Even so, physics is an essential part of Stoicism. They're insistent on this, I think. And there are some basic ideas in their understanding of physics that do play an important part in their philosophy as a whole. And the one that I want to focus on now is what I'm going to call interconnectedness. So the Stoics argue that nature is a single organic unity, an interconnected whole. We are all parts of something larger than ourselves, and our well being depends on that larger thing. Marcus Aurelius puts it like this. He says, all things are woven together and the common bond is sacred and scarcely one thing is foreign to another for they have been arranged together in their places and together make the same cosmos. As well as being parts of this single unified cosmos, we are also all parts of wider communities of people, both locally and ultimately as parts of the community of all humankind. And we are dependent on those communities too. Unless of course, you happen to grow your own food, make your own clothes, process your own sewage. But I doubt many of you do all of that. But anyone who does manage that degree of self-sufficiency from other people, would I suspect be even more aware of their place within and dependence upon nature? In short, the Stoics are going to want to insist that none of us can survive on our own. 
we all rely on each other and we all rely on nature. And we need to take that into account as a fact about the world in the choices that we make. But also we don't need to choose between what's in our own personal interest and what's in the interest of the community or what's in the interest of the planet. Because ultimately these are going to be the same. The person who acts in a selfish or antisocial way has failed to grasp this key idea of interconnectedness. And the Stoics would say that such a person needs to go back to school and study their physics. Their moral failing is in part due to not properly understanding how the world works. So in this sense, we can see not only interconnectedness among all things that exist that the Stoics will insist on, but also, I hope, we can begin to see the interconnectedness of Stoic philosophy itself, with physics underpinning ethics, just as earlier we saw logic underpinning ethics. We need all three bits of the jigsaw. And if any of you have read Marcus's meditations, and I'm sure many of you have, you'll know that much of the time he's reflecting on his place within nature. There's a sense in which physics is never that far away from his thoughts. And anyone who's dipped into Epictetus will have seen him both warn against wasting time on academic logical puzzles, while at the same time insisting on the necessity of studying logic. If he warns against not getting lost in academic logical puzzles, the only reason why he needs to warn his students against that is precisely because they're spending so much time studying logic. Because for Epictetus, this is an essential part of training to become a Stoic. Okay, so I think we can point to these three key ideas in Stoicism, one from each of the three parts of Stoic philosophy. From logic, we've got this idea of judgments, from ethics, virtue, and from physics, interconnectedness. Judgments determine our experience of the world. Virtue, the one thing that always benefits us, and interconnectedness, we're parts of something larger than ourselves. Now, earlier I mentioned the importance of consistency for the Stoics. I talked about the virtue of being rationally or logically consistent. And we might also think about ethical consistency in both our behavior and in what we expect from others. Do unto others what you would have them do to you, as the saying goes. If we admire someone for being trustworthy or reliable, for instance, we are in part admiring the fact that they're consistent. And there's also what we might call psychological consistency. So someone who's constantly changing their mind, jumping back and forth, unable to make firm decisions or concentrate on one task at any time is unlikely to be able to lead a calm and tranquil life. And so it looks like we need something like psychological consistency too. Now for the Stoics, all these types of consistency are basically one and the same. It's all about having a consistent character. A consistent character that makes consistent judgments. Or to put it the other way around, it's about making judgments consistently so that we develop the habit of thinking and behaving consistently, which is what a consistent character is. Now, the founder of Zeno, uh, the, sorry, the founder of Stoicism, Zeno, said that the goal or the aim of human life is to live consistently. And I think what he had in mind is the sort of mental consistency that I've just been describing. 
His pupil and successor as head Stoic, Cleanthes, expanded this statement of the goal of human life to living consistently with nature. And his pupil and successor as head Chrysippus expanded it again into living consistently with our experience of what Three minutes, John. according to nature. And I don't think there's any great disagreement here. I think they were all just trying to find the best way to express the same basic underlying idea. And I think there are a number of different aspects to this basic idea. So there's to live consistently, i.e. to be rational. There's to live consistently with nature, perhaps in two slightly different senses. So to live consistently with human nature. So again, to be rational, but also to be social. We're social beings, we're social animals. Alongside that, to live consistently with nature as a whole, with nature, with nature with a capital N, we might say. So to be ecological, to work with rather than against the natural world. So the topic or idea of interconnectedness again. And then finally, to live consistently with what happens according to nature, which is to say, to accept what happens to us that's out of our control, to embrace fate, we might say and so on and so forth. These are all different aspects of this single Stoic goal of living consistently. And this is what I think an ideal Stoic life would look like. It will be rational, it will be social, it will be in harmony with the natural world, and it will be without complaint. And in order to do that, we need to do three things. We need to pay attention to our judgments, we need to focus on what's inherently good, namely having a virtuous character. And we need to understand that we're parts of a larger whole. One minute, John. And if we do all these things, the Stoics think that we can live a good, calm, happy life, no matter where we are or what circumstances we find ourselves in and what life throws at us. So that's the Stoic challenge. If you've not tried it before, give it yourself, give yourself, give it a go next week, sign up for Stoic Week. We'll hear a lot more about that from Tim in just a moment, I'm sure. Thank you all very much.